Hello. I'm Dr. George Backers, Professor of Medicine and Director of the Hypertensive Diseases Unit at the University of Chicago Medical Center. Today I'd like to talk to you about the JNC7 guidelines. You can see my disclosures uh, on slide two and the learning objectives for this module are delineated on slide three. You can read those on your own. So risk factors for cardiovascular disease clearly uh, are important to understand in terms of how to reduce them so that we can reduce risk. This slide basically shows you the major cardiovascular risk factors, blood pressure being at the top, and of course components of metabolic syndrome such as uh, obesity, dyslipidemia, in addition to blood pressure are all on this list. Kidney disease is on this list, and I think it's unappreciated by many, but needs to be respected as a risk factor, as is, of course, increasing age, the ultimate trump card that not anyone can really modify. What is the prevalence of hypertension? Well, the prevalence of hypertension increases with age. And in fact, more than 50% of people between the ages of 60 and 69 will develop hypertension. About 75% of those uh, age 70 or older will develop hypertension and this is primarily systolic hypertension. In fact the lifetime risk of developing hypertension is about 90 percent for people that don't have hypertension, men and women, age 55, who survive to age 80 or 85. So it is almost inevitable. In fact the lifetime probability of being treated for hypertension is about 60 percent. It is a process of aging. Four-year rates for hypertension progression in those 65 years and older, uh, you can see, is about 50% for those that are in the uh, what used to be called high normal uh, or now high prehypertensive range of 130 to 139, and 26% of blood pressures between 120 and 129 systolic and 80 to 84 diastolic. I think it's important, this is data from Framingham, that shows you very nicely what the effect of high blood pressure is on CVD prevalence and you can see that even if you have so-called optimal uh, blood pressure control it's pretty clear that your risk increases with uh, time and of course the higher your pressure is within the prehypertensive range the higher your risk. Now what about age and blood pressure? We've been talking about this the trend and the pattern of blood pressure changes with age. Up until age 50, diastolic blood pressure is really the most important factor that you need to focus on. Not that systolic is less important, but diastolic blood pressure is really what's driving cardiovascular events. After that, it's all about systolic blood pressure, and in fact, diastolic blood pressure starts to decrease with age after 50. So, in most people in this aging society, it's all about systolic blood pressure. And so I think as a general rule of thumb, if you use 50 as the cutoff, people above 50, you should really focus on getting the systolic blood pressure controlled. People under 50 or at 50, the diastolic blood pressure is probably where you want to be in terms of focus. Now, B, in terms of focus. Now, what about coronary disease? And if you look at what we just said in terms of systolic and diastolic blood pressures in the context of coronary heart disease you can see with age as you go up the systolic pressure really trumps the diastolic pressure in terms of the risk and you can see uh, in this slide of Stan Franklin's it's almost linear so very important point to keep in mind in terms of the observation about the relationship between cardiovascular risk and blood pressure what about family history? I mean, hypertension is a genetic disease, polygenic. We don't know what the genes are, but we definitely know that a family history clearly is important. And family history is an established risk factor for CVD events, as it is for hypertension. Half of all the cases of coronary disease can be explained by family history. 14% of families with a known family history of heart disease accounted for 72% of the cases 
of early heart disease before age 55. So what should be the goals of therapy? Reducing cardiovascular and renal morbidity and mortality by obtaining the uh, goal for systolic blood pressure is really the key. Treating systolic and diastolic pressure to less than 140 over 90 is the general goal for everybody and really should be the focus, unless you have diabetes or kidney disease, at which point the focus should be less than 130 over 80 based on current guidelines. You can see the benefits in the next slide of reducing systolic blood pressure and how much benefit you're getting based on the amount of systolic blood pressure reduction you've achieved for stroke, CHD, and total mortality. So again, very important observation to keep in mind. Now, JNC7 reclassified blood pressure. We did this because we wanted to uh, make it easier for the physician to understand the risks and easier for the patient to understand the risks of certain levels of blood pressure. Because of the notion of aging and the ultimate development of hypertension, we use the term prehypertension as opposed to normal or high normal because it resonated better with focus groups we had of actual patients that had hypertension, saying that if they were told they were prehypertensive, they would actually ask the physician for interventions, even if the physician didn't volunteer any. We also reduced the stages to stage 1 and 2, not because stage 3 wasn't around anymore, but because we figured you wouldn't do anything differently if you had stage 3 versus stage 2. You would be aggressive and you would try to get the pressure down, and so it would be one less stage to worry about. So those are the essences, and you can see the numbers. Uh, they haven't changed at all from previous guidelines, or at least JNC 5, but they certainly were amalgamated in different ways, and again, the reason for going down to 120 was an epidemiological paper that was published around the time that we put the JNC together that showed that cardiovascular risk in ages 40 to 80 starts at a level of 115. And so, again, we wanted to make sure we captured the spirit of that in the nomenclature. Now, what do you do? Management for recommendations from JNC7. Obviously, if you're prehypertensive, it's all about lifestyle low salt, smoking, uh, exercise, etc. But if you have a compelling condition for a specific class of antihypertensive agents, then clearly those should be given. But if not, it should be about lifestyle. On the other hand, if you have stage 1 or stage 2 hypertension, um, the, the bottom line is that you need to be using uh, either thiazide diuretics or a combination that involves thiazide diuretics so that effective blood pressure control can be achieved. This is really the can be achieved. This is really the goal. Fixed dose combinations are where we're going. The first trial of fixed dose combinations, the accomplished trial, has now been published in the New England Journal. And so people really should not be afraid to migrate towards starting with fixed dose combination of antihypertensive medicines. Lifestyle modifications, this table that you can see here in figure uh, in slide 14, is a table that is in the JNC7, and I was asked to put this together to show the uh, differences of blood pressure, the range of blood pressure reductions you can achieve strictly by doing lifestyle modification. So I think this is important to give physicians an appreciation for what lifestyle can actually do if the patient adheres to it. Now, what about antihypertensive medications? There are a whole host of antihypertensive medications. You can see them listed here in slide 15. And we also should add to this the endothelin receptor antagonists that are soon to be uh, coming out. Um, so there's no question we have a panoply of agents that can reduce blood pressure by a number of different means different mechanisms. We can mix and match these for complementary mechanisms. And really a way to do that is shown in the next slide. Looking at the blood pressure equation, keeping in mind heart rate is part of this equation as well, and looking at the different classes of antihypertensive agents and how they actually interact with the uh, equation of blood pressure. You can see certain classes like beta blockers, calcium antagonists, diuretics, actually affect both sides of the equation and so would be quite useful 
as agents used early on to uh, give you a benefit. But there is a lot of focus on peripheral resistance and uh, a very popular combination that's been used in many people are blockade of the renin angiotensin system in concert either with calcium antagonists or diuretics, which you can see fit both sides of the equation. What did JNC7 recommend as an approach that would be reasonable? Well, the algorithm is shown in slide 17, and we very clearly said that if your blood pressure was greater than 20 over 10 above the goal, and you don't see that there, but you do see 160 over 100, that's 20 millimeters systolic and 10 millimeters diastolic above the goal of 140 over 90, you should start with two drug therapy. If not, you can start with monotherapy and build, depending on the clinical situation. 20 over 10 was derived from the same analysis that we got prehypertension from because it showed, that analysis showed that for every 20 millimeters increase in systolic and 10 millimeter increase in diastolic pressure above 115 over 75, there was a doubling of cardiovascular risk. And so even at 135 over 85, while you're below 140 over 90, your risk is higher for any given age between 40 and 80 than you would be if you were at an even lower pressure. So again, this is why we recommended starting with combination therapy. The second point in the slide, which I think is important, is to use agents that have compelling indications. And we sorted that out very nicely in a table. And lastly, and I think as important, Patients and physicians should know when to see a board-certified hypertension specialist of the American Society of Hypertension. And this is what the final box indicates, is if you have a patient with resistant hypertension, defined as three or more drugs, uh, actually three drugs at maximal doses, and you still have not achieved goal, then a hypertension specialist should be the referral point because that would be a way to um, get a more focused workup and um, this is the whole point of having a board certification. Now what are the barriers to achieving blood pressure goals? There are a number of factors, everything ranging from the patient to the physician to the system and they all really interplay together. There are cultural norms that People don't want to take medicine. They don't want to be sick because taking medicine means they're sick. There's a failure to comply with lifestyle modifications, which is very common. There's the cost of the medicines. There's the cost of the foods. If you go on a uh, DASH diet, that's not cheap. It, it actually costs some money. So there are a lot of factors that need to be interplayed, and there needs to be an understanding of the patient with the physician as to what these factors can be, and lifestyle, make no mistake, can have a huge influence on achieving blood pressure control. The patient needs to be educated about this from the physician, and you need a team, so you need the dietitian, and you need the patient's family to help you in achieving this goal. Now, what about other factors with compliance or adherence, actually? Well, there are influences on uh, compliance that involve the patient, the disorder, the treatment, as we said. But I think this next point is really a very important point. Why do patients discontinue treatment? 46% thought they were cured. So blood pressure, you get on medicine, blood pressure comes down to the range, and now they think they're cured. They perceive antihypertensive agents as antibiotics. They need to be given an understanding of what hypertension is. They need to be told this is not curable, it's treatable, and their risk can be managed with treatment. Side effects you'll notice are a far lower percentage than no the notion that they were cured. Cost is probably the least fa amount of factor that's in this, but the physician needs to be sensitive to that. So all of these factors and the interaction with the patient, the family, and the education uh, between the physician and the family and the patient are all critical factors to improving adherence. It is, in fact, a multi-pronged approach. So I'd like to summarize by saying that there are several risk factors for developing CVD, including hypertension. The prevalence of hypertension increases with age. Family history is a strong predictor for the occurrence of CVD. 
The goals of therapy in hypertension are pretty simply this, to reduce cardiovascular and renal morbidity and mortality by attaining systolic blood pressure goal. Everyone should have their blood pressure treated to a systolic of less than 140 over 90. And if you have diabetes or kidney disease, the current recommendations are less than 130 over 80, although with pending trials such as Accord, uh, that may change. The JNC7 does provide a reclassification, as we covered, for hypertension. Hopefully it's a simpler classification. And the management strategies, including recommendations for lifestyle and antihypertensive therapy, were covered. Lastly, and I would say as if not more important, the barriers to achieving blood pressure goal exist and center around the understanding of the patient and the family with what the physician is doing. The best way to do the, treat this is to make sure there's an educational message sent by the physician to the patient and the family as to what can be achieved with cooperation, not only with taking the medicine, but also with other lifestyle modifications. Thank you very much, and have a good day.